it. The rest of it's <laughs> just going to be. <laughs> Those will be the outtakes, the director's <laughs> cut. All right, we're letting people into the room. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started in a second. Uh, just so you know, we encourage everyone to keep their cameras on, but please mute yourselves until um, the end of the session. Or if you want to ask a question, use the raise hand function, function uh, towards the end of uh, the recording and Lindsay will call on you. Um, I guess we'll go ahead. There's Eric. Eric's coming into the room. All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to our Authors on Tap reading series. I'm Javier Ramirez, and along with Christian Gilbert, we run Exile in Bookville, a little gem of a bookstore on the second floor of the Fine Arts Building here in downtown Chicago. Uh, it's no secret to our millions of viewers out there that we are huge fans of $2 Radio, who are publishers, booksellers, and restaurateurs of the highest order. So when I received an early copy of New Animal by Ella Baxter late last year, I was, of course, predisposed to read and love it. Then I saw a blurb. I don't know if you can see that. I saw a blurb, the first blurb on top there by somebody that I knew. Um, and uh, I read the book, totally agreed with this person. That person is sitting here right now. Uh, she's going to be in conversation. Ew. With Ella Baxter, uh, it says another guest, uh, Lindsay, <laughs> your co-host here tonight. Uh, it was Lindsay Hunter, surprise, surprise. Uh, one of our absolute favorite, one of my favorite writers uh, of all time. I'm so lucky that she lives here in Chicago. I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, uh, Eat Only When Hungry is one of my favorite novels, but I'm a huge fan of uh, her short story collection. She can do everything, um, especially do these things, these in conversations. Uh, she's one of our favorites. We always go back to her, hope she never gets tired of it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we're here with Lindsay and Ella. Uh, $2 Radio is awesome. They publish some great stuff and um, they, they're publishing Ella's first novel. Uh, we will have uh, books for sale. We have a big stack right over here. You can't see it, but a big, big stack on the counter. Please uh, go to our, our uh, website, exileandbookfield.com and order plenty of copies. The holidays are right around the corner. They'll be mm -hmm. here before you know it. Yep. Um, so let's uh, let's get me out of the way. I'm gonna introduce Ella and Lindsay to you. Ella is a writer and sculptor living in Melbourne, Australia. It is Thursday there in Australia, by the way. In her spare time, she runs a small business making bespoke death shrouds. She is currently writing her second novel, Woo Woo. Is that really the, that's awesome. Great. That's so good, that is so good. <laughs> Ella will be in conversation, of course, with Lindsay Hunter tonight. Lindsay is the author of two story collections and two novels. Once again, most recently, Eat Only When You're Hungry. She lives in Chicago with her family. Um, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, enjoy the show, everyone. And please welcome Ella Baxter and Lindsay Hunter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ella, I wasn't sure if you wanted to read a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, I haven't, I can grab it off the shelf. If, I yeah. would love that because um, if, if anyone hasn't read the book yet, it is so, I was just telling uh, someone else this, I, I've read it twice. I read it first to, to blurb it and then I read it again to prepare for this. And the first time I read it, it was so funny and I could not believe how much I was laughing on every page. And the second time I read it, it what struck me was its poignance and its beauty and its, um, just it's true, pure love. And so it's a, it's a very unique voice. And so I would love to hear, even if it's just a page, I would love okay. to hear you just read whatever you feel like reading from it okay. as a treat. I'll start with the first page. Um, there is a man with kind eyes and crooked teeth in my bed. He's facing me and smiling, preparing to talk. I cough once loudly because talking is unnecessary at this point. We both watched patiently as he prodded my vagina with his hangnailed finger, and we both took turns sighing mid-thrust. Afterward, Adam squashes my memory foam pillow until it's wedged beneath his armpit for support. He squints at my framed certificate hanging above the bookshelf. My stepdad, Vincent, paid for the framing in honour of all the technical skills I had to learn because he likes to celebrate stamina and effort. My mother even made a cake. Certificate five in embalming awarded to Amelia Aurelia, Adam reads aloud. I tend to focus more on the cosmetics aspect, I explain. Right, he says, turning towards me, funeral makeup. He passes his lips while continuing to crush my only good pillow. 
I kick at the bed sheet until it's down around our ankles. The cotton has absorbed the smell of sweat and salt, some foot odour and a slight muskiness lingers. I toss the whole thing onto the floor and lie back on the bed, uncovered but still sticky in the muggy room. More? No? Enough? I think that's great. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a really good taste of, <laughs> of what people are in for. It is, it is a wild ride. Um, once again, for people who haven't read it yet, uh, it is... Um, starts in a funeral home where Amelia works and ends in Tasmania in a different funeral home. <laughs> and in between there, there's BDSM, there's death, there's life, there's love, there's sex. And um, like I said, there is um, just beautiful familial love and um, sort of a, a reckoning with one's a reckoning between one's soul and one's body, um, which I really want to talk to you about. Um, and it's beautiful and hilarious and everything <laughs> in between. Um, and like Javier said, you know, anytime I hear it's, it's coming out on $2 radio, I think, oh, well, obviously it's going to be, it's going to be so good. And, and once yeah. again, they've hit it out of the park. They're um, amazing. I, they're amazing. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about where this idea came from, where you started with the book, any sort of influences as you were writing or, um, you know, even before you started. Sure. Um, I started when I was 26. So that's 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I had just come out of a period of not reading. I had kind of abandoned mm -hmm. books just because I didn't see myself in any of the female characters. I was reading and I was finding it just a bit, I don't know, I was just kind of over the literary sphere in a lot of ways. And I just wanted to focus more on visual art at that stage. And um, writing for me has always been trying to work out what I can't quite understand. And so when I started it, I was really grieving. And so I was trying to understand grief and I was trying to put into words like where grief was located in my body because it really confused me like I knew like jealousy and stuff was always felt in my chest or like anxiety was in my stomach and like you know I had all these places where emotions went but I couldn't find grief and so I thought I'd just write until I found where it was in my body and um I was also really I guess fascinated and repelled by sex at the time and I just kind of didn't understand why and I wanted to work that out as well so it wasn't supposed to be a book at first mm. I, I wrote it over six years and it obviously now is but at the start it was just really writing whatever came to mind about both sex and grief mm -hmm. where did you did you actually locate grief in the body did you find it yeah it's the throat wow yeah, because you can't say, you can't, you can't speak all the things you need to say. And that's yeah. part of the pain because it's like people ask you and people want to talk to you or they invite you to speak to things or about your emotions. But it's like there's just this huge torrent of words that can't come out. And it's like they bottleneck like, there. Yeah, they just bottleneck. And when I realized it was in the throat, I felt like I could work through it more. Did the book change at that point or was that yeah. after you were done writing? Okay. No, it was, it was, it was all the process of it, I think. And that's when I could really articulate Amelia's grief because I could articulate my own. Mm. And um, I was reading lots of accounts of grief, lots of books on, you know, death and was it Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, the questions of death and dying, things like that. So I was really trying to embed myself in grief and death to understand it, understand as a universal experience, but also under, understand the impact that it had individually on people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was just, it was just writing it from the inside out, honestly. And it, mm -hmm. it was, I, I'm so glad that I got it out. Yeah. I am too. <laughs> um, <laughs> the ending that you come to um, is, like I said, it's a, it's a reckoning between her body and soul and this realization that our bodies are dragged around with us mm. wherever we go. And um, 
and all the things that she remembers or thinks about doing to her body. Um, and sort of looking at this dead person that she's working on at the end of the book, um, and realizing, you know, all sorts of things, realizing, you know, and being thankful and having gratitude for the body mm -hmm. that she has is so I'm, it's not a spoiler. Don't worry, anyone, <laughs> you should still really read it. It's there's so much that happens. Um, but it's so beautiful and so cathartic and transformative. Um, and the way that you're talking about where you came from, you know, the place that you were in as you were writing and this, this, this quest that you were on to locate grief and then locating it. And yet it is so fucking funny. It is so hilarious. And, okay. and almost on every page, there's something you know, one of the, the parts that I laughed the hardest at is she's having a beautiful moment with her father, Jack, and there's a fly in the room and, <laughs> and he starts getting really mad about the fly in the room. And she just thinks to herself, people who live alone don't realize that they get upset so easily over the smallest things. And I, I don't know, that's just so true. <laughs> I'm so no. glad you found it funny. That's great. <laughs> I, I know part of me feels like a jerk for saying that because it's also so beautiful and sad. Um, but I think that's true. I think that's very true of, of grief mm. and life in general is that it's kind of all there. And, um, there's so much absurdity, isn't it? Like yes. in, in everyday life, there's so many points where I just think this is completely ridiculous. Or this is, this is the juxtaposition is, is alarming. Like there's so many things where you think oh, I'm going to be really serious and invested in this. And then something will just unravel you. Yes. and I, I just love that stuff I I need to grab onto it every time it happens it's humanity right it is it is absolute humanity people just being freaks you know and not not even really like paying attention to their freakishness it's just them you know going about their day <laughs> and yes. then it's just you noticing it do you keep a list of these things when you notice them or are they just mentally filed away I both really, but I'm always looking for it. I'm always like on my walks. I'm always, I have this like, even it's like a game where I look at a house and I guess whether it's like a divorced man lives there or a woman or like, you know, like I, I feel like you can tell just from the exterior of a house who lives in, inside it. And it's just, it makes me realize that on a street with 50 houses that looks similar, you know, they're all in a similar demographic. They probably earn within, you know, the same bracket as each other. There's this, this these moments of individuality that leak out, you know, like they yes. all have neat lawns and like clean bins. Yes. But even then you still see them on the yes. exterior of their house. And I just am addicted to it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could see a whole collection of stories just about house after house after house after house never yeah. even entering in yeah how so how did you come to Amelia's voice that it, it's so um so funny and and you know I I know that's part of you but how did you get to her voice and how did you stay true to it as you as you wrote it took ages and I think um I was telling Eric actually at two dollar that I wrote 130 something versions I think there's 136 <gasps> versions so not like edits but different stories of it oh and gosh. each one was really different so there was like a really sinister one there was a really depressive one there was a really like um I kind of really abstracted it and it was quite kind of um grotesque and like circusy and then there was the humorous one and when I got onto the humorous one I heard her much clearer and mm -hmm. so it was like she started to make sense and once she made sense all the other characters and the arc of the story kind of clicked much more into place because she was instigating a lot of those actions and reactions within her circle of people and mm -hmm. also what she was doing to herself like her body and so yeah I felt like the humor made her voice clearer but I you know, I still don't know what a character is and what writing is. You know, it feels like you're channeling something. It feels like you're almost haunted or possessed by this, this thing outside of yourself. And even though a lot of myself is in New Animal and a lot of my 
thoughts and feelings, Amelia felt entirely separate. And, you know, I remember missing her a lot and feeling quite lonely for her when I wasn't writing her, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I still don't quite understand the alchemy of being creative on the page like that. Mm -hmm. I don't either. And I think that's good. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we should understand. No, it's <laughs> meant know? to be mysterious, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But in the same way, I'm like, you know, with my current manuscript, the voice is just, it's, it's like just slightly off. I need mm. to like, push it into where it needs to be but I can't hear it and I'm like what well, <laughs> just come when you're ready like yeah I'm here <laughs> the day deadline day is looming so. now. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's how I am with my historical fiction novel on Britney Spears I just can't get her voice right <laughs> but I'm glad because I feel like it's if that's my lifelong unfinished work so be it okay oh, yeah. you can circle <laughs> slowly around till you land yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, no matter how much Instagram of hers I absorb, it's still, I still can't get to her, her voice, yeah. but that's okay, because it's fun. Is, is how you, oh, go ahead. No, she's, I was just thinking of some of her Instagram captions. It's hard to, it's, it, they're, they're, they're laden with yes. so many possible things. It's, it's a real yes. ride. It's a ride. Yeah, she's like, easy. I love croissants and chocolate is delicious. <laughs> My ass isn't fat anymore. Take a look. And you know, know. what? Jamie Lynn can go fuck herself. <laughs> and then like she uses emoji like emojis like hieroglyphs and but they're not often related to what she's saying. Yeah. Like, what is the true meaning of this? <laughs> I know. And then there'll be like a picture and it's the mm -hmm. same picture in four yeah. of those slideshows. And it's like maybe a slightly different filter. And then like days later, it's the same picture and yeah. the same slideshow and I'm like what did I miss what is this a cry for help I know there's a whole podcast and maybe multiple podcasts that like break it down and are like in communication with her somehow so yeah. one day I'll get to that but it is very enjoyable to just start with yeah Paris is so fun in the spring and end with I hope my dad dies <laughs> or whatever yeah. I honestly think you know I love her emancipation because she's just really being allowed to be her creative wacky self and I just think it's fantastic Everyone's it is embracing it like oh yes and I and I think part of it is that um like she was frozen in childhood and so yeah. she's still very childlike even as she understands that she's a grown woman and she very much wants to be a grown woman so it's like I feel like it's that conflict of like a very pure innocent child and a very angry grown woman like mm -hmm. all exist inside her and a mother um, so she just, she just fascinates me. Um, actually before this, I had my Britney Spears shirt on, but I had to change it because your book is pink. I really, we should have coordinated. I have a pink fluffy. Next jacket. time, next yeah. time. Um, I want to kind of talk about the love that Amelia has for her family. Um, it's something that I found myself jealous of because I feel like when I'm writing families, I'm always looking at the dark, the darkness, um, you know, who's neglecting who and, and what traumatized who, and there's that in there as well. You know, there's, there's pain, but the love that she has and the acceptance that she has for her father and her stepfather and her mother and her brother and, and his thruple is so beautiful. Um, and I, and I, I felt like my heart, like drinking it in, like it was healing in a way. Um, and also as a writer, I was jealous of it. And I, I just want to know how that came to you. Was it natural? I mean, you said, you know, once her humor came in and the family and the characters sort of fell into place. Um, and I know they think she's wild and, and they, they also accept that of her, but how did you open yourself up to that? I guess I really didn't want her situation to be the cause for her behavior. Cause I feel, I feel like that's a really common trope especially with females that go off the rails or females that spiral it's always like really linked to oh their upbringing or something like that and I just wanted to divorce her from from those excuses and to present a character that just is kind of a bit unhinged and maybe always has been I believe people are born the way they are in a lot of ways and of course your upbringing impacts you but I think like when I look at the people in my family, they were just born uniquely individual. And 
I, I really like that she hasn't got something to just blame it on. I think mm -hmm. it makes her search for more meaning as she goes along. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I come from a very eccentric family and I sometimes wonder if the eccentricities that I have, I've not just adopted from the people that raised me and actually I'm very kind of fundamentally suburban and straight, <laughs> but you know, like <laughs> it's, it's this, I feel Nature like, versus nurture. <laughs> yeah, I'm just really interested by that. And I just think perhaps with women in literature, I really want to bring more of them to the page that are perhaps a little harder to understand. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm just, I really, I enjoy reading when I'm like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Her love was, for her. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just, it was conscious. It wasn't like an unconscious, yeah. you know, happenstance. Yeah. Because her love for her mother is so beautiful um, in the way that she remembers her and thinks about her and needs her um, and knows that her mom would, would answer that need if she could. Um, yeah. I just found that so striking and beautiful. Yeah, I think she's in that stage of grief too where it was that acute missing, you know, that real yeah. cut too short and too sudden. And I just felt like it's funny, the only thing, there's a line in the book and it is exactly how I felt about grief at the time. It, it does feel like a bus that's come too soon or yeah. something, like you've really just you've just missed all those opportunities and there's all this stuff that's left hanging in their wake and it's like what am I supposed to do with that what am I supposed to do with all those questions all those things we didn't do you know like mm -hmm. where, where do you put that now that they're gone and I mm -hmm. think that she was working through a lot of that with her mother yeah mm -hmm. they had a very close relationship yeah <laughs> that that decision she makes to leave and go mm -hmm. to her fa her real father. Um, I, I found myself going, no, Amelia, you know, and, and, and that's what makes me, made me feel so connected to her as a character because I, I, I felt that I was reading, you know, she's so real. And, and I kept thinking like, no, you need to, you need to go and there's still time. And mm -hmm. um, it was such a brave choice on your part. And it allowed for all this other, all these other things to happen and for her to open up in all these other ways. How did that choice come to you? Did it feel yeah. like poking the bear or did it feel like this has to happen? I felt like it was a real natural reaction for her because she had such an innate understanding of like the body and the processes involved in preparing the body for whatever funerary practice is about to happen, whether it's burial or cremation. And so I felt like knowing what was going to happen to her mother would have completely, um, I think, freaked her out. That's what I felt when I was writing it. And I also felt that her whole um, deep reverence for the deceased, that would have been shaken by her mother dying because mm -hmm. what she was saying previously to that happening was that they're like these beautiful sculptures whether the soul is there or not you know it's a magical thing the body and it's like it's perfect as it is whether it's living or, or dead and I feel like her mum dying would have just challenged her on those thoughts and she mm -hmm. I don't think she would have been able to look at it that's what felt right for her in in me when I was writing it but um I think too also like funerals are just also really hideous and I when I was doing the research I was just so, so shocked at the aesthetic kind of nature of them all they all had this really strange aesthetic like this like pink satin mm. dark mahogany terrible carpet and it's not like any fault of the funerary businesses it's just how they you know it's it, it is like this strange thing they've all landed on Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was visiting a lot of the funeral parlors around Melbourne, I just was like horrified by them. I thought I wouldn't want to put anyone in here. I don't feel like any of my friends would have a good send off in this place that is like, you know, there's cherubs and like doves mm -hmm. and 
you know, it's just so twee on a level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. I, in some level, it feels like, um, like the ritual of it is what matters, mm. but, but yeah. it's, it also seems like if you're sending off someone you love, you would want to do that in a, like a unique, yes. meaningful way. Right. Yeah. And it also feels like in this day and age, wouldn't it, shouldn't it be becoming more and more popular just to be like thrown under a tree or something, yes. you know, like thrown into well, the ocean. Oh, look, there's so many, there's so much stuff. Unfortunately, the legislation isn't ca catching up with like all these amazing ideas they've got for burials now. Yeah. But yeah. I really want to, um, with my death shards, I want to soak them in mushroom spores. Oh, so you can, cause you know, you can have those suits and you turn into like this amazing mycelium colony. And I just oh think that God. would be brilliant. I, yeah, I want to hear more about your bespoke death shrouds. Um, and before we get back to the book, I, I want to know like how you came to that and, and yeah, how do I sign up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll send you one. You. Um, I used to give them to people I loved and I actually, I had my own, um, the first death shroud I made was my own and I hung it above my work table. But when wow. I moved into my husband, he was like, absolutely not. This is really macabre. I don't want it, I don't want it in the house. And so I, was, I was really horrified because I thought it was this like amazing relationship I had to my final yeah. cloth. And yeah, I know he, every time he walked past it, it was like this oppression for him. <laughs> like accept me and my art. <laughs> but um, no, no. Uh, yeah, like I actually stopped making them when I was pregnant because it felt like um, like having a life inside me and working on something that was going to house something that was dead just it felt really at odds. So I stopped for that period, but I'm starting up again mm. soon for the next collection. But yeah, I um I started when <laughs> when my cat died. Oh. I always hate this story because I feel like such a a nutter in a way no but, um, are you kidding me my cat died and I didn't cope very well with it and um that I missed his body so much he's like he had this really particular weight to him mm -hmm. and I couldn't sleep after he'd passed unless I had a jumper the same weight on my legs because that's where he used to sleep and it just made me really start the kind of thought process of really deeply respecting bodies and like the physical form and the lump of ourselves and so then I started making burial shrouds um I made him one and I just started making them for people and pets and it's just like I call them art I mean, to me they're art but um mm -hmm. yeah you can either actually you know burn them with the person or bury them with the person or you can hang them up on your mm -hmm. wall so yeah I mean I would absolutely hang up my death shroud yeah. Um, I have three kids. I mean, we, we have all kinds of art in the house and some of it scares the kids, but I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, it's just art. It's, I mean, yeah, I've got them hanging now. I won't show you cause they're half done, but, um, yeah, like they, they just look very linen and light and patterned and they're not, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I mean, kids are, kids love talking about death. Um, mm. you know, and like, we've lost a pet in my children's lifetime. And so, you know, there was lots of questions about that. Um, but there's a point like in our, like maybe adolescence or pubescence where we decide, or maybe young adulthood where we decide we don't want to talk about death anymore or we're not, I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. Cause a lot of, you know, I don't know, maybe it's when you turn 40, I don't know. Cause oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm going to be 42, but no, I, it is like this, yeah. this taboo thing that it almost feels like you're summoning it to you. If you, mm talk about it too much or, or like, I don't know, alerting the grim reaper that you exist. I don't know what it is, but kids, my kids love talking about death, blood, guts, like yeah. all of it. But it's at some point that stops being the case. Um, and I don't think that is healthy. I think it has something to do with not, not being connected to your body. Yeah. Maybe it's so, maybe our ideas of death are so disconnected from from us and from our actual lives you know we're quite we kind of sanitize it and even the way we put 
makeup on people who have passed you know what Amelia's job is is like a very strange Mm -hmm. actually actually quite strange to put makeup on someone who's passed Mm -hmm. but that's for us to be Mm -hmm. able to process their face as if they were living you know we want to see them like they were but they're not like they were Mm -hmm. and isn't that creepier to see Mm -hmm. them painted like that like I, I think there's so much we should unpack from Western death practices. I think a lot of other cultures have just much more beautiful and kind of embodied ways of mourning and rituals around it. I think, yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the Western world has got to catch up. I, at my grandfather's funeral, my dad, it was his father, kept he would he stood by the coffin it was an open coffin and he kept asking everyone to touch his father's forehead Mm. and you know most people were like it's okay you know and he'd be like no touch it and then you would touch it and he'd be like see he's gone oh wow yeah so it was his way it was his his way of processing that I guess yeah um oh paper humans I know humans I I mean they just I equal parts just I'm so sick to death of them and also just have huge empathy. Like, I know. <laughs> really. But they're best at arm's length at all times. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been playing Bjork for my kids recently and there's that Bjork song, Human Behavior, where she's like, if you ever come in contact with a human, just like, you know, it's all about humans are freaks, total Very freaks. <laughs> we won't accept it. Um, I would love to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, this catharsis that you went through as you wrote, um, locating yourself in your own body. I think you mentioned in your acknowledgement, some work that you did with someone that helped you on that process. Am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. That was just a few people that helped. Um, I can't remember which one it might've been now, but I, yeah, I mean, I went to ashrams and did kinesiology and did every esoteric kind of therapy that you can think of yeah I really tried it all Mm -hmm. um but actually I think it's just time and feeling the feelings like you know what everyone tells you to do actually ends up being the balm you need unfortunately Mm -hmm. I thought I could get it out in other ways or quicker but it just it just takes ages Mm -hmm. ages Mm -hmm. a very long time and I think like I'm constantly in a state of mourning, but that's not a bad thing. It's like, it's, it's much more, I, can, I feel like I keep using the word embedded, but I think it's cause I'm focusing it on that word, particularly a lot in my practice at the moment. Like I do feel like, you know, you are, it's a, it's a continuum. It's a continuation of that, mm-hmm. of that. It doesn't need to dissipate or go. It can just be part of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And during that time, were you also working on your sculpture? No, the, stu- the sculpture came later. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. No, I was doing other sculptures. Yeah. Um, but strangely, well, I guess they are death related. I made huge cocoons. I mm. made really big cocoons. That is later. related. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that was pre- perhaps praying for a rebirth at some point <laughs> oh man just crawl in and then crawl right back out a liquefy and then emerge yes <laughs> oh my gosh yeah how do you feel like I because I it's very strange that that I came to your book when I did because I had been thinking a lot about um like the ways that mothers just have to push through no matter what you know like um and I have three kids so it's like constant noise and happenings and emotions and like, you know, like trying to be who each individual child needs from their mom in that moment. And sometimes that I I get very disconnected from myself. Um, and so it's like, I, I've been thinking a lot about how, um, like I get angry at my body for how, um, like reactive it is, you know, like, um, how it gets bigger, it gets smaller you know, like I, I, I I get mad about that. And then I, and then I've been thinking like, you know, well, why, why do I feel that way? Why do I feel so disconnected? Um, 
And so I, it's just wild that I came to your, to your book where she has this realization at the end that, you know, no matter what, even when you don't feel connected, you're connected. Um, and it's important to pay attention to, you know, to what you're doing. And, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's like, you're saying, um, in, in the act of making, you know, making art and making books, it can, it can bring you back to that. Cause you're doing something with you're doing something with your hands. You're doing something with your brain, you know, and, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I always felt like I was attracted to art making because I feel so disembodied when I'm in that state, mm. when I'm, you know, sewing for hours or when I'm writing for hours, I forget I have a body. I'm in this complete cerebral different zone. Yeah. And it's, um, even though all my art and writing is about the body and about the mind, it's like, I, I approach it from a different plane in that state. But since becoming a mother, I, I'm not allowed to disembody like that. I'm not allowed to, because I'm like, I mean, I'm breastfeeding. I'm up all night. I'm so in my body and I have this very small being who needs me to be in my body and needs me to be on this physical plane and it's the first time in my life I've had to make schedules and cook and like actually take note of when food needs to arrive and disappear and like it's just done my head in because up until this point you know I had a baby kind of late I guess at like 36 and I just can't believe what living in the world is now like I feel like I've just started because I've just been making stuff in my head for so long and I know it is a shit show like it's a <laughs> shit show <laughs> no one told me <laughs> I know I know I feel like I had a friend at my baby shower put her hands on my shoulders and say Lindsay you are going to be miserable she had just she had a baby a year before me and then it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to get better. And I remember thinking like, what a bitch, why would she do that to me at my shower? I know, what terrible foreshadowing. <laughs> I know. And then like later I had the same thing, you know, I thought the same thing you did, which was like, nobody told me. And it was like, people did try to tell me, but it's, people, it, yeah. it doesn't matter because it's different for every person, you know, Maybe. like it, like, yeah. I, I remember trying to tell so many friends, like the same thing that she told me and then come to find out they had the baby and they were just like loving it. And they were in, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to try to tell you that like anymore. That. Yeah. I, I remember like when milk came into my boobs and I was like looking at the milk come out, I was like, oh my God, I'm a mammal. I'm a mammal. <laughs> like I'm a creature. And my husband was like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Like I'm releasing this book called New Animal while I literally am becoming <laughs> this new animal. It was such a strange time. It still is. Yeah. We're living in a simulation, is what I think. I think that's oh, what's happening. It's crossed, honestly. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We can like make little edits as we go. Yeah. I want to do this now. I want to live in this multiverse now. <laughs> um, I would love to talk a little bit before we turn it over um, for questions sure just broadly mm -hmm. what is it like having this book out in the world um and what are you hoping people will get from it I really it's well it's I feel very vulnerable obviously I feel very um raw and mm -hmm. like itchy and kind of uncomfortable mm -hmm. especially when you start getting tagged in you know, I woke, I think it, it did, it, did it come out today in the U S or was that yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah. Yep. I was tagged and I woke up and I had, you know, 50 notifications and it's just, you know, a very, um, exposed feeling, I think, um, yeah. quite raw, but it's good. I'm so, I feel so lucky and I feel like, um, uh, I feel like such a, I feel shame, you know, I feel embarrassed and shame and all the thing. I don't know. I just feel it all at the moment. I yeah. Feel like I find it uncomfortable, but I'm very proud. And then I'm really happy and feel like, yes, this is my career. This is what I was made to do. And then I feel like, no, it's terrible. <laughs> it's nothing. Don't enjoy it. Like, cause if I enjoy it, then 
it'll turn bad or something. I keep thinking it will go from like sweet to vinegary if I pay too much attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What was the, was the second part? It was like, <laughs> how do you feel? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've been meaning to say that to someone clearly. No, I, well, first I just want to acknowledge what you're feeling and thank you, you know, like thank been there. And I often tell myself, well, people only publish you because they feel sorry for you. <laughs> I know it feels like you've just, you're like the dog that caught the bone and ran off or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're coming after you to get it back. Or, I don't yeah. Know. They're like, Oh, poor Lindsay. Like yeah. take some pity on her. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I, I found myself at events sort of apologizing mm. to the crowd before anyone had even read it, just like apologizing for what they could find bad about it or something, which yeah. I do anyway, you know, like I, I walk into the room and I'm like, I have BO or, you know, whatever, yeah. <laughs> like trying to like circumvent what people might think about me. Um, so I just want to acknowledge where you're coming from. Cause I feel, I feel that every time. Thank you. Liz. And, and I hope, um, pride and excitement overtakes that or is the most of what you feel because this book is so fucking good. Um, I remember when I got to read it to blurb it, I just, I just felt so lucky. Oh, um, that's nice. it just spoke to me immediately and, cool. and it's like a slim little guy. Yeah, there is no fat on this guy. And I'm going to call it, actually, it's not a guy. It's a woman. Um, and anyway, you don't, I guess you don't need me to tell you how much I love it. Cause I know I've done it a bunch, but it is. Thank you though. I really appreciate it. And like, I just, yeah, thank you so much. It's so Please. nice to hear the nice words. My second yeah. question was, what do you hope people get from it? Mm, I think it's that, uh, there's a part towards the end and it's like, she's, naming all the times she's you know walked her body into parties it didn't want to be at made it get haircuts it didn't like made it sit up you know and behave really and I feel like if if you were to get anything from the book I would love for you to get that we really do kind of expect so much from our bodies and we're mm -hmm. so resentful of them you know mm -hmm. at the slightest hint that they don't work it's like oh it's fucked or this is you know it's like we don't recognize how how far they carry us just mm -hmm. on like a whisper of like self-confidence at times like I just I think just that that idea that our bodies actually work with us and for us very hard I don't know yeah I think that's what I got from writing it it reminds like me of um, how my Peloton instructors always say, we don't have to do this. We get to do this. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> Be thankful. Thank you, Peloton, once again. Um, on that note, I would love to turn it over to the audience. If anyone has any questions uh, for Ella about this wonderful book. Yes, feel free to ask anything. Or if you don't want to, I also understand. Or death shrouds yes funerals bodies yeah funerals and bodies it's a it's something we're all gonna have to deal with isn't it like a few times in our life I hope my bus doesn't come too soon yeah <laughs> I I don't I don't think it will Eric no. says we're both amazing <laughs> Eric the publisher <laughs> thank you Eric <laughs> There's no question mark. So I'm taking it as a fact. It's not, you're both amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. You're amazing. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> Exclamation point. Brilliant. Anyone else? Okay. Well then I think we should release Ella back to her beautiful world where her baby is sleeping under an apple tree no I can hear him screaming now. oh screaming okay <laughs> my children just recently stopped screaming so we really are an opposite yeah <laughs> thank you so much I this is a true honor and a absolute pleasure to have been able to read this and talk with you about it it is such a great book so excited for you so excited for two dollar radio 
thank you for like taking this time. I really I had so much fun and thank you. Yeah. To Kavia and everyone at Exile and just, yeah, $2 and everything. I'm going to end it by saying woo woo, because that's the book you're writing. <laughs> yes. And I can't wait to read it. Uh, can't wait to finish it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you guys so much. This was fantastic. Um, I can't say enough about this book either, Lindsay. We, we're both on the same page. Uh, and um, I, I just, there are scenes in the book that I, this isn't a question, it's more of a comment, um, that will always stick with me. I read the book last, late last year. Um, and the, the where there's this great scene where it goes over a couple chapters where um, uh, Tanya is is overseeing her, uh, her uh, sort of, she wants to be a dom and she's she she wants to learn and she's not really learning she's just sort of stumbling over herself and that scene is one of the funniest scenes i've ever read but also as lindsay said it's a very heartwarming book but it's also very it's super funny and, and i didn't touch on any of that and i oh can't God, believe it i don't, I don't, <laughs> like, want, I don't want to talk much about it because if you those of you out there the tampon yes exactly <laughs> I, I was reading it while you guys were talking and it is it is like one of the funniest scenes I've ever read in a book that and it and I felt bad for laughing but at the same time I thought this is what you meant this yeah I meant. as I read that I was like oh, oh, oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh buy copies of this book uh multiple five ten send them out to everybody it looks like bubble gum you can't chew it but uh you can read it and enjoy it See you guys later. Uh, you can't read it and enjoy it. Um, uh, uh, one of my favorite books this year, uh, and I'm so lucky, thanks uh, Eric and Eliza and all the great people at $2 Radio and Ella for writing this wonderful book and giving me a chance to enjoy it early. Um, and, uh, and I'm really excited to sell it to everyone. Um, oh. Thank you, okay. thank you so much. And Ella, we hope to see you for the next book as well. Um, yeah. and, and Lindsay, as always, you're, you were incredible. We had, always come prepared and you always make these so enjoyable um i forget that i'm a zoom on a zoom sometimes i can't wait to have you in the store uh so thanks everyone for showing up i hope you had a good time and go buy copies we have bye everyone <laughs>